Hi there. This is the Hitachi MPEG-1, a digital camcorder from 1997. Pretty early for a device like that. I bought this at my local junk store having no idea what it was. The price was right, it's cute, and I like camcorders. Got it home and started looking into it, and found that it's probably a pretty important piece of the history of digital video recording. I've never heard of it, for reasons that will become obvious, but despite its flaws, of which it has several, it's still, I think, an important part of history. It demonstrates what was going to come, but came too early to start a revolution. A revolution that would, in fact, take much longer than I think anybody anticipated. The consumer electronics industry, who are cowards nowadays, used to be mad lads who didn't care if things were impossible and would produce a product that didn't actually work just to get something to the shelves before anybody else, often through massive feats of technological ingenuity only to produce a product that didn't really do what it was supposed to do, but did technically check the boxes. This is, I feel, the story of the Hitachi, which is the earliest all-digital video camera that I'm aware of. Rather than being a repurposed still camera that can also shoot video, it is a video camera that happens to include a still feature. Hitachi was so dedicated to this being a video camera that they actually call it the MPEG cam in the manual, and the model number is MPEG-1, which if you're not aware, was an incredibly popular video codec at this time. This camera makes no compromises that would interfere with its ability to shoot video, which is not to say that it does not make a lot of compromises. Let's take a look at the unit itself. I have to say, it's one of the most pleasing gadgets I've ever owned in a number of different ways. First of all, it's built like a shit brick house. All the panels are metal, the fit and finish is second to none, it doesn't rattle, and it has weight to it. It feels like a lump of steel, or perhaps guilt. You don't forget it's in your hand, but in a good way. While this kind of chassis can scratch easily, Hitachi included these two big rubber ridges on the back, which I'm pleased to report have not turned to goo. These just serve to keep it from sliding around or getting scraped up on a hard surface, and notionally make it stick a little better in the hand, since, frankly, you have to have gigantic mitts like mine to palm this thing. It doesn't have a side strap or anything, so you have to grip it at all times, which is a negative point. I have remarked before on how every time a new medium comes out, camera designers decide that cameras don't need to be camera shaped. This one is guilty of that, but I think it feels pretty good. Despite not being vaguely camera shaped, I think the controls are laid out ergonomically, at least for me, I can reach everything just fine, and the controls fall in comfortable places. The buttons are all pretty positive and clearly labeled, although there is a reason they can fit all the labels on this control panel so neatly, which I will touch on later. On the side here, we have the usual record versus play selector that's on every video camera. And I should note, every time you turn this device on or off, there is a deafening click, which seems to be something in the camera mechanism itself, maybe some kind of protective internal cover, but it really gets noticeable as you're using it. It feels bad every time you make it happen. Below the mode switch is a big rubber flap that's really tough to get open, and it covers up this horrifying proprietary connector. So if you have the cables for this thing, don't lose them. You can never replace them. If you've got one, put the cables in a little Ziploc along with the camera. Someone will thank you someday. On the other side, we have a DC input. Just a plain DC jack. You could just shove power into it, even if the battery is dead. Below that is a speaker, a fairly sizable one, which is another indicator this is a dedicated video camera since there wouldn't be that much use for one of these on a still camera. Below that, we have the battery. Now. Ironically, despite the fact that I was just talking about how rare DC jacks are, because the batteries for old cameras always die and you're usually just screwed without them, uh, this battery pack is actually still good. Now, I'm telling you that this battery holds a charge. I'm, I'm not saying that it turns the camera on for a minute or so and then shuts off. I'm saying that I used this for all my test shooting for this video on one charge. That's over 30 minutes of shooting. And for reasons that will become obvious, that's pretty impressive. Really though, it's just shocking to find any 90s era lithium pack that's still working. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen this before. What black magic is going on here? Now below that, we've got the cover for the media. Now, it's kind of unusual. You've got to unscrew this little retaining screw here, and then this guy pops up, and then this flops off, and you'd think it would be hinged down here, but it isn't. It's just sort of free floating, so you can just lose it. Now, that seems odd, but it's partially because of how unusual the storage itself is. This takes a PCM-CIA hard drive. 
PCMCIA, or PC card, was originally a memory and storage format, and this sort of thing was not uncommon at the time. It's an actual spinning hard disk, about two inches in diameter, uh, with a 260 megabyte capacity, which beat any kind of flash memory available at that time. So this was a significant chunk of data in these days, and the reason that it's awkward to get out of the camera is you're not really supposed to take it out, um, for reasons that we'll go into later. This is supposed to just kind of stay in the camera, just live there throughout the whole lifetime of the thing, ideally, and you're not supposed to just unplug it and shove it into your computer like an SD card every time you want to get your videos off. There are other ways to do that. So it sort of makes sense that this just gets bolted in like this because it's really meant to be kind of a component of the camera itself. One bummer I'll warn you about if you want to get one of these yourself is I don't think it works correctly with flash media. I tried putting one of these CF to PCMCIA adapters in here. And while it does recognize it and it will work in some modes, the main video mode does not function on this. It refuses to actually record video. So if you want to get one of these, if it doesn't come with the hard drive, you're going to have to prepare to find the correct hard drive for it. Finally, on top, we've got the actual camera lens assembly, which you'll notice is facing us because this in fact has a selfie mode, much like some contemporary camcorders like the Sharp View Cam. This will rotate so you can film someone else, or you can film yourself, or you can film somebody to your left, I guess. When it's in the rear facing position, you'll notice that it's not actually flat. It's tilted a little bit. And I think this is just so you can hold the camera at a slightly more natural angle. An odd thing about this camera, it has no lens cap that I could find, no lens cover internally or automatically, and there's no filter threads. So you can't put on like a UV filter or anything. So if you drop this thing, you're going to destroy the lens and there's nothing you can do about it. The camera came with a few accessories and among those is this guy. It's a little plastic stand. You can set the camera in to use it on a surface. Now, this is kind of unusual. You'd think they would just include a little tiny tripod, but I don't think there were many of those at that time. I don't, I don't think very many people had a use for them because GoPros and video cameras of this size had not yet been invented. Uh, but it's a little peculiar to me that they didn't just make their own instead of this big injection molded plastic thing that's got a steel plate on the bottom. Still, it is a nice stable way to hold the camera. And maybe the selling point over a tripod is that it tilts, but it doesn't roll, it stays horizontal. So if you're using this on a desk, you're probably recording yourself with it. You're gonna set it up here and then tilt it up so it gets a good shot of you. And you're not going to want it to roll at all. You're only gonna want the tilt. So maybe that's the reasoning. The battery charger is typical for the era. You've got the battery mount here on the side, and then on the other side, you've got this jack into which you can plug a cable to supply power to the camera, hence the DC jack on the side. However, there was a frustrating thing about virtually every power supply of this type. It can charge a battery, it can run the camera, but when you plug this cable in, it turns off the battery charger. This is tremendously frustrating because what you wish you could do is run the camera off the DC plug while your battery charges and then put the battery back in once it's fully charged, but you can't do that. And on top of that, if you put your battery in here, but you leave the DC cable plugged in overnight because you forgot to unplug it, your battery's just gonna sit there and do nothing. And in the morning, instead of having a usable battery, you're gonna have a still dead one. I hate that so many manufacturers did this. The camera also came with a pop-out hood for the LCD. So you snap this on here, doesn't really snap. And then when you're out in strong sunlight, you can just flip that guy up and it shades the screen. Very nice feature. This was not a common thing on camcorders because they all had eyepiece viewfinders at the time, even if they also had flip out LCDs. So if you couldn't use one, you could just stick your eye up against the other. But since this one only has the main LCD, if you can't see it, this camera is useless. It also, of course, came with an AV cable, plugs into the multi-pin connector on the side here, and then you can connect it to someone's television. This was commonplace with camcorders because they often used formats that people didn't have players for, like VHS-C or Hi8 or Video8. And with this particular device, it's advantageous because this device produces nothing that you can put into any standalone video playback device. So if somebody didn't have a computer, the only thing you could do to show them video was to plug this into their TV. So that's almost everything this came with. Not a ton of accessories, but fairly valuable ones. There's one other accessory that we'll look at later, but first let's see how the camera itself functions. 
Operation is pretty dead simple. You put it in cam mode to record. Now it takes a few seconds to start up, as you can see, because it's spinning up the disc and checking its contents. I admit this has already led to me missing a sudden event that I wanted to record, so it is a downside. With the apparent longevity of the battery pack, you could just leave it turned on and idle, but I'm pretty sure it'll spin the disc down eventually and it would take just as long to spin it back up. I'll spin this to the side here so you can actually see something. The LCD is pretty bright and clear. It's got decent resolution and refresh rate, doesn't smear too bad, but it doesn't have very good contrast. Uh, in strong sunlight, it often looks like parts of the image are massively overexposed when in fact they look just fine when you review the footage. The on-screen display can be turned off, of course, but it is pretty information dense. You've got the recording state, recording speed, date and time, battery state, remaining record time, current length of recording, and then the recording mode, of which there are four. This is video, and then there's still, continuous, and audio. The video mode is 352 by 240, 30 FPS at a fixed 1.5 megabits. Now, I don't know how this will look, but if it looks decent, just wait till you see the rest of the footage. It's showing its good side right now. Still images are 704 by 480 JPEGs, which look like this. The continuous still mode can shoot at about two frames per second for a maximum five frame burst, and you can get about 3,000 JPEGs on the hard drive in the best case. The last mode, audio, allows you to take a picture and then record audio to go with it. So this is 32 kilohertz, 128 kilobit mono MPEG audio, which actually sounds pretty good. And you could record up to four hours of it on this hard drive, which is interesting because I'm not sure you could buy a portable hard drive based audio recorder of any kind at any price in 1997. So I suspect that this actually had longer runtime than any other portable recorder in existence. Now, that's not my wheelhouse, so I could easily be wrong, but I think it's possible. Now the audio is sadly probably the best part of this device because as a camera, it's basically photographer's kryptonite. One of the reasons for this comes back to what I was saying earlier about the control panel. It's very nice and clean and neat because there aren't any actual controls on it. If you notice, there's no macro flower, no focus control of any kind, no exposure, no white balance, nothing. All the controls on this camera are fully automated. Even if you delve into the menus, there's nothing in here that actually affects how it records, just some simple LCD adjustments, formatting the card, setting the date, etc. The only thing that affects how it records is the record type, which can be set to clip, which just means that it'll only record when you hold down the record button, like an old film movie camera. This is terrible news to any photographer or videographer. Really, I think anyone who's ever touched a camera would be aghast to see this, but I don't think all the controls in the world would have saved this camera from the problems that show up once you actually look at the footage. Let's do that now. For startsies, let's just take a walk outside. Now, pausing right here, this freeze frame doesn't look all that bad. Yeah, it's very low resolution, but it's not jarring. It just looks like a low res photo and you can more or less make out what's going on. But now let's open the door. Right away, things are much worse. Some of it is about what we'd expect. While you can make out the shape of the compost bin, the text on the side is illegible. And of course, the bushes are a jumbled mess. If you have any knowledge of video codecs, it won't be shocking that the details suffer horribly in low bit rate video, but it gets worse. It's hard to make out what kind of vehicles are parked outside, for instance. The telephone pole in front of the white truck is just a meaningless blur, and the colors everywhere are atrocious. This is garbage. This is nothing. It's not just bad, it's useless. At times, it seems almost reasonable. For instance, I went out on the street and recorded a vlog, something this camera is suited for, with the rotating lens and the smartphone-like hand posture. It feels like it was made for this purpose. And for some reason, the macro blocking is nearly invisible here. You hardly notice it. On the other hand, in my backyard, the texture of the plant life just wreaks havoc on the codec and my face is almost unrecognizable. In a slow pan across the sky, you can see the compression nosedive when the foliage comes into view, then the image softens when it leaves again. When shooting these miserable little flowers, things go from shredded to okay to shredded again with what feels like little rhyme or reason. Even images that I think are less complex end up rendering much more poorly than others and there is a logic behind this, I'm sure, but I don't have the eye for it, and I would expect very few consumers would have either. I was worried that this was happening because of my specific environments. Maybe it just looks bad in direct sunlight in my backyard. So I wanted to go try a completely different venue. Welcome to the forest. I'm vlogging from the forest. This is Cougar Mountain, one of Washington's unspeakably beautiful forests. If you can't get good looking footage out here, you can't get it anywhere. 
I realize this is a little unfair to the MPEG cam, which we can already tell does better in less complex environments, like my basement studio, but what good is a camcorder if you can't take it anywhere interesting? Sadly, the compression issues are just as bad here. It's not something magic about my backyard that was doing it dirty, and that's really a shame because this place looks incredible. If you brought your camcorder to visit somewhere that looked like this, but the footage you brought back looked like this, you would return that camcorder. Even when it feels like the codec is doing better than usual, the image is still incredibly muddy, and I don't think the resolution itself is to blame. 352 by 240 is nominally similar to VHS. It should be able to replicate most typical scenes in a lifelike fashion, yet that doesn't happen here. Watching these planes take off, you'd be hard pressed to even identify their manufacturers. They're really fuzzy, which I think is largely the fault of the encoding, although this is a good time to point out that the lens is really not helping things. A massive super zoom lens would have alleviated the resolution and encoding problems to some extent by allowing you to make small objects dominate the frame, getting the best bang for your bitrate buck, but instead you're limited to this laughable 3x zoom. Digital zoom claims to get it up to 6x, but that only works when your sensor has more pixels than are being recorded in the file, which this one doesn't, so digital zoom just makes the picture more pixelated. Conversely, the camera also has absolutely pitiful close focus. The manual states that the minimum distance is 11 inches, which is why these flower clips look so terrible. You simply can't focus closer than a foot, which is incredible for something with such a tiny sensor. And the only explanation I have is that the lens does not actually do any focusing. I think it's fixed at infinity, which sucks really bad. The colors are also not great, as you can see from the blown out livery on the tail of this plane. And I can tell you that the green on the other plane is also not right at all. This would seem to actually be the fault of the camera itself, since still photos of the same scene look just as muddy and awful. To try to prove this, I hooked up the AV output to a high quality portable recorder and went out again to see if the picture looked better if I bypassed the MPEG cam's encoding circuitry, and the answer is a resounding yes. Ignoring the improvements from the superior compression, everything else is better. The color, sharpness, contrast, and detail are all improved as well as the frame rate. It's a full 60i, which makes me think that the camera is not a native digital unit, but an ordinary analog one connected to a crappy digitizer, which is trashing the image even before it makes it to the MPEG cam's awful encoder. So many of this camera's problems could probably have been alleviated with a better AD converter. That said, the MPEG cam itself did do a lot better here than anywhere else I tried, probably due to there being much less distinct foliage in the scene, but I don't think that really gets it off the hook. I admit, this is probably a much less adversarial environment than the other ones I tested in, and the footage probably looks a lot better. But what's the point of a camcorder where you don't know if the footage is going to be usable until you get it home and look at it? At that point, you might as well just shoot on film. In scenes with fast motion, the camera does a little better, simply because detail is not as important and you don't have time to pixel peep anyway, but even then, the pictures simply do not look good, and I think it's safe to say that this camera would not really have been useful for anything. As well built as this camera is, and for whatever clever features it offers, it all just falls apart when you look at what it actually records, and almost entirely due to poor compression. So how and why did this happen? What it comes down to, I believe, is that this device just doesn't have the processing power to encode the video effectively. See, it uses MPEG-1, but neither the codec nor the bitrate nor the resolution are an excuse for how bad it looks. For instance, this extremely misleading sample video from the CD, which you definitely could not produce with this camera, looks outstanding, really. It's detailed, lifelike, smooth, more than watchable, but it's at the same resolution and lower bitrate than the MPEG cam. It's only 1100 kilobits instead of the MPEG cam's 1600 or so. So how is it so much better? Well, a property of MPEG and many other codecs is that they only specify the format of the file, not the method used to produce it. As a result, there are many different approaches to encoding it, and the amount of computational power you put into it determines the quality of the output. I can illustrate this. Here's a video that I shot with my cell phone at 4K and H.264. Now let's take that same video and crush it to the same codec, resolution, and bitrate as the MPEG cam. That's this. And now let's take the video from the MPEG cam shot in roughly the same place and time and put it here. Now once again, the MPEG cam has the bitrate advantage. It's shooting at about 1600 kilobits while my video is locked to 1500. And yet the MPEG cam is nearly unintelligible while my footage looks almost like a low quality DVD or a really good VHS rip. Virtually all the characteristics of both these files are identical, except that one of them had all the power of a 2020s computer put into encoding it, while the other one got whatever Hitachi could squeeze into the MPEG cam. 
You see, this camera doesn't have a CPU in it doing the encoding. It has a dedicated custom chip, an actual hunk of silicon that Hitachi designed themselves. They were apparently pretty proud of it, and I can't blame them. They made this in 1996, and designing a complete MPEG encoder decoder chip at that time was pretty tough. However, it seems to me that they just didn't put enough oomph in it. The best explanation for this camera's problems is that it simply doesn't have enough computational power to crunch the numbers fast enough to produce a reasonable quality output. It may produce 1600 kilobits of data, but it's using very simple math to do it. I can actually demonstrate this phenomenon. If I take the same video I showed you, the 352 by 240 version of my cell phone video, and then I tell the encoder, FFmpeg in this case, to use only half as much computational power, all of a sudden it looks a lot worse like noticeably worse. If I ask the encoder to use as little power as possible, quality level 31, the worst the FFmpeg can do, we get this. This is garbage, it's unwatchable, and it's still better than the MPEG cam, which is astonishing. The MPEG cam produces the worst footage I have ever seen in any format, except for that time that someone sent me a copy of the entire B movie compressed to eight megabytes. The cause of the problem seems straightforward to me, but the question is, how did Hitachi look at this and go, oh yeah, this should go to market? How did they not see that this was unusable and pull the plug? Well, I have absolutely no idea. I couldn't begin to tell you. There's no information. Um, however, for some utterly baseless speculation that's definitely wrong, but leads to a convenient segue, maybe this device originally used a different codec when they were developing it, one that was more efficient, used the processing power and storage they had more effectively, and then they had to pivot to MPEG-1 when their marketing department decided to switch this device from just being a general purpose camcorder to taking on the fastest growing phenomenon in telecommunications history. See, once you're done shooting video on this thing, you've got to play it back somehow. Now, you could just get the AV cable and plug it into a television. Uh, let's take a moment and see what that looks like. Okay, so it's a tiny bit more watchable, but not much. Even on a little CRT like this, the compression artifacts are still grossly visible. And anyway, Hitachi wasn't really targeting that market. They didn't just want to make a camcorder that happened to be digital. They wanted to make one that was ready to take on the internet. In 1997, MPEG-1 was probably the most widely supported codec in the world, and people were getting internet connections at a breathtaking pace. Hitachi saw the coming revolution of internet video, thinking it was going to happen any moment, when in fact it took another decade plus, but they thought this camera could be at the forefront of it. Their marketing for this actually suggests that you shoot video on this camera and just shove it straight onto a website unedited. Now, nobody was going to do that, edited or unedited, given the quality of this camera's footage, but let's see what that process might have looked like. Since the storage medium is PC card, you might think you can just pop it in the side of a laptop. And you'd be right. Any laptop with a two-slot card bay can accept this drive, and on most OSs, it should just pop up and work right away, showing up as a normal mass storage device, like a USB drive. You can simply copy the files right off the card and watch them. Of course, if you didn't have a laptop, this wouldn't work. You could buy PC card adapters for desktop PCs, but they were often fairly inconvenient. And if you had, for instance, an ultralight laptop with one slot or no slots, you were out of luck completely. Hitachi did provide solutions, however. Two adapter kits were available for the MPEG cam, both of which plug into the big multi-pin socket on the side. One of them adapted to the parallel port, which virtually every computer had at this time, and the other was a proprietary ISA card, which they simply call the ISA interface, which provides some kind of unknown connection over a six-pin DIN plug. The ISA card is odd. It's clearly missing a lot of components that could have been on there, among those AV in and out jacks, as labeled on the board. Now, the multi-pin connector on the camera has so many pins that I strongly suspect they intended to have AV in on the camera from the get-go, and that this board would act as a sort of port replicator when it was plugged in. But there aren't enough pins on the DIN cable to support those signals. So I don't know if this was meant to be some sort of standalone video input-output card for the PC, or what? At any rate, either attachment method allows you to get your videos off of the camera without taking the drive out, like I said earlier. You can just leave it in there indefinitely, and when it fills up, you plug it into the computer, copy your files off, wipe it remotely, and then keep going. One bummer, however, is that when connected using either method, the camera does not show up in my computer. In order to access the drive, you have to use Hitachi's software. The software is unsurprisingly not very good. I don't think Hitachi developed it themselves. I think they got some random studio to just slap together the bare minimum viable product. So it's pretty rough. Basic file transfer is accomplished with Pure VI, which is little more than a basic file browser that happens to have been extended to recognize the camera driver. 
By the way, I kept having trouble getting it to recognize the camera. Turns out that's because I was putting it in play mode, which is what anybody would think you should do. But if you notice, the PC mode is actually the record mode. That's bizarre, but okay. The UI is not stellar. Um, if you want to copy files off the camera, you can't just drag them out of the window and drop them in an Explorer window. You have to navigate through the tree view, find the folder on your local drive you want to put them in, and then go back to the camera to drag them out. This is a nitpick, however. Most people would not really have cared about that. Now you'll notice that there's five folders here. These are actually created automatically by the camera because it supports a feature I'm not sure I've ever seen before. From play mode, you can press media navigation to see the list of files on the card. This is actually a pretty crisp and intuitive interface. It displays a list of folders and a convenient summary of what quantity and type of files are in each one. Along those same lines, there's a menu option to see how much space is remaining on the hard drive, and it displays that in terms of each media type that you can record in at once, as well as the raw number of megabytes remaining. So it's a very well thought out UI. Descending into a folder, you can view thumbnails and metadata and select files to play, but you can also pull up a menu and select change folder to move a clip between folders. This allows you to categorize your media in the field, although as far as I can tell, there's no option to do this in bulk or to record by default into a particular folder. So you're gonna to have to move every clip every time you create one. But it does mean that you can put all of your vacation whale watching videos into the whale watching folder. You can also reorder clips in a folder. Since this camera can be used in an auto play mode, you can manually move these around to create a playlist, one per folder. Hitachi actually had some interesting ideas about how that could be used, which we'll touch on later. Another very curious feature in here is the ability to modify the date and time that a clip was recorded. Never seen that before. I feel like its only possible use would be fraud. Going back to the software, PureVI doesn't do much else. It can remotely update the time on the camera or format the card, and it can command the camera to start playing a video on the LCD, but that's about it. It's very bare bones, no remote capture or anything like that. Next up, while Hitachi did suggest that you could simply upload your MPEGs directly to websites, I think almost everyone would have wanted to do some amount of processing first, so editing software was a must. Now, at this time, Adobe Premiere and a few other nonlinear editors were available and fairly mature, but they also cost a fortune and required a beast of a machine. So what we get here is uh, less than that. The first tool is called Easy Cut, and if you used Virtual Dub, it's like an extremely cut down version. You can scrub around a video, pick a beginning and end of a single clip, and write out that one clip to a new file. That's it, zero options, but it does get you the absolute bare minimum. Next is the very awkwardly named Media Chef slash Clipping. This is in fact a non-linear video editor, uh, but perhaps the most awkward one I've ever used. First, you load up a video in this window here. There's no scrub bar. You can't navigate around. All you can do is hit play, which simply previews the video without letting you interact with it at all. Or you can press start. That begins to slowly play through the video. I'm not sure why it moves at 10 FPS, but it does. As it plays, you can see the video appearing in the window at the bottom. That's the timeline, and the video image represents the current selected clip. If I hit cut, it'll place an edit at that point in the video, make a new clip, and keep rolling from that moment. And I can continue doing this until the video is fully divided into segments. The next step would be to hit stop, then start going through, finding the clips I don't want, and deleting them. This is in itself not that different from a modern NLE process, just very awkward. Normally, you would do these same actions by scrubbing through the video, placing edit marks here and there, and deleting the parts you don't want, just like we're doing here. But this program, for some reason, forces you to do it in this weird gonzo sprint, where you can't pause, can't rewind to catch a missed mark. You just have to run through the whole video, smashing the cut button on the fly as fast as you can. It's weird, but maybe it's explained by limited processing power or something? I, I don't know. To clean up the edits, you can then right click on each clip and go to trim, which shows you a sort of rudimentary timeline with each frame broken out so you can find exactly where you want to start and stop and adjust each trim point. This is actually not a terrible way to do it and I kind of wish it just worked like this from the get go. In fact, you can sort of edit like this by just dropping the whole clip into the timeline directly, then going to the split interface, which allows you to pick a point to split the video into two clips. You can then repeat this process to find each desired cut point, then delete the in-between clips. But since you can't actually play the video in full motion this way, it's really hard to find the right spots. At first, I thought this could only do one file, but no, you can actually drop in other clips and assemble a video out of several different pieces of media. It only does MPEGs, no still images, no AVIs, but this does at least give you the bare minimum functionality of a pair of video editing decks. You can take two sets of footage recorded separately and assemble them into a basic composition, like this. Welcome to the forest. I'm vlogging from the forest. <laughs>
One of the other included programs is Media Chef Print, which is actually kind of weird. I've never seen anything quite like it. Its purpose is to convert a video into what photographers call a contact sheet. Basically, it offers options to split the frames of a video into a series of stills and print them on paper in a grid. You can auto-generate the sheet by picking a frame every few seconds automatically, picking frames by hand, or a few other methods. Each frame can be given a custom caption or just labeled with its time index, and you can also select a border. I'm not super sure what this program was intended for, but basically, in an era when digital video playback was still not super convenient, it makes sense people would want to put a video onto paper somehow. The one remaining interesting program is Authoring Master, which is sort of like a terrible hypercard clone. The program launches with an empty canvas, which you can then populate with a background image and any number of buttons. The buttons can either pop up an image, play a video or sound clip, or jump to another authoring file. With this, you could conceivably produce a sort of interactive presentation by connecting one sheet to another and providing buttons to link back to the prior ones at each step, but it would be majorly tedious. The options are also remarkably limiting. You can't even put custom text on the canvas. My favorite feature is the kids mode versus business mode options, which simply change the borders from colorful ones to fake chrome ones. The other programs are nothing to write home about. There's a Photoshop knockoff for editing stills that just has the usual basics that every cheap photo editor had at the time, cropping, drawing, rotating, and simple image effects. There's also a standalone software-based MPEG player for people who have no MPEG decoding built into their OS, and that's about it. So the software is rudimentary, to be kind, but that's really in keeping with the rest of the camera, which is only technically a camera. And I think one of the reasons for that is that it was probably a prototype. You see, a year later in 98, Hitachi released the M2, which several magazines reported on as if it were exactly identical to the MPEG-1. The specs seem to be the same, the chassis looks exactly the same. So what's the difference here? Well, I found this fact on mpegcam.net, which explains the differences, and they're pretty substantial. A SCSI interface, a mic input, AV in, the ability to pause and fast forward, the ability to split videos in the camera, and yes, a macro focus mode, which I think probably just means the lens, you know, actually focuses at all. And let's not miss this, improved video quality. This is a prototype. That's the thing that was supposed to come out in 97, but they couldn't finish it in time, and some executive walked in and said, well, it's gotta be out by Christmas. So they buttoned up what they had, dumped it on the market, unfinished, and then a year later, when they'd actually completed the project, they put out the real one. And of course, by then, the damage was done. Anyone who was aware of this thing was not gonna buy the second one. By the way, one other interesting feature in this list. They said that they would include a PowerPoint converter that would convert a PowerPoint presentation into an MPEG you could play on the device. And the use cases for this are obvious. Uh, the idea of using this as a portable source for a slideshow at a business presentation is really cool. Um, now, I don't see why you couldn't just put a bunch of JPEGs in a folder instead and hit play. That seems like it would be higher quality, unless you were going to put moving pictures in the presentation. I guess in 98, people were still obsessed with the PowerPoint presentations where the, the word art flies around and whatnot, so maybe that's what they intended. It is a neat idea, though. But given the price of this thing, which was somewhere between $1,600 and $2,500, depending on which website you check, I don't think any number of neat tricks would have saved it unless they improved the encoding quality. It needed to actually be a good camcorder for anyone to want to buy it. But I doubt they achieved that even in the M2, because the MPEG cam series died there and didn't go any further. Or maybe it did, depending on your perspective. By 2001, Hitachi had updated mpegcam.net to state that the M2 was no longer available and that the DVD cam was the next generation. This makes a lot of sense. DVD camcorders record MPEG, albeit MPEG-2, and they record it onto disks rather than hard drives or flash drives, but they basically achieve what Hitachi intended. You could shoot digital video and then immediately pop it into a computer and start editing it without having to wait to scrub through an entire videotape. Now, I did a whole video on this topic where I explained that these did have their own faults, but they were much closer to the ideal that Hitachi imagined when they created this device. So the MPEG camcorder, in the fullness of time, was vindicated as a product, but 97 was just too early. If you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing so I know that you like this sort of thing. Remember to turn on notifications because I upload kind of irregularly. If you really enjoyed this, consider supporting me on Patreon. All these people here are making it possible for me to get stuff like this to show to you, and it would be very hard for me to do without their support. I'm so grateful to all of them and to everybody else for watching this video. Thank you.